to people of who, who were going through other, other um, realities. Like his reality was white, 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 and that was what we were taught, what my family was taught, it was the whole neighborhood. Through, through TV characters, uh, shows like, like Star Trek Next Generation, the, the episode uh, Let This Be Your Last Battlefield, uh, taught me a lot about racism. Uh, the introduction of the Black Panther in Fantastic Four comics is how I learned, eventually learned about apartheid. The, the experience of the characters, the trauma they go through, the, the things they deal with, um, you know, it, we talk about fantasy being escapism, but often it's a doorway into understanding reality. A lot of really good science fiction and fantasy and horror are there to, to tell real truths, but, but, you know, couched in a way that we can, we can have that discussion. For example, with that episode of Star Trek, which was about racism, you could not have put an hour-long drama about racism on TV in 1966. They would, it would not have, they would not have approved it. But you could if it's two alien races. Yeah. Um, so it, it allowed me to have to learn without the fear of having to take those, those questions and try to ask my father because that would have been a fight. That would have been, that would have been the wrong way of, of handling it. I learned, you know, about, about racism um, because of that and Black Panther character, and it started it encouraged me to have conversations about what I was feeling because I see what characters are feeling, and if somebody else is writing that then the, the fears uh, and, and trauma that I'm going through can't possibly be unique if somebody else is showing about it, showing it and talking about it. Um, and th that is certainly continuing to today. This, this, you know, the fantastical stuff we write is a vehicle for, the, for conversations about the truth. Vicarious learning is so much easier for us to accept instead of a lecture about life lessons. And when we can have that vicarious learning and have the ability to step back when it becomes too uncomfortable, but still be intimate enough to go, okay, this applies to my life, I can relate it, it becomes so much more powerful. And I think that's part of what you're saying. I think too, like um, talking again about Star Trek, for me, I grew up in the Deep South. Um, I was raised by two Marines, and I was a closeted builder because it was an option for a girl in the South to be someone that enjoyed being in the garage and playing in the shop and rebuilding engines. And I kind of found that network of strong women through watching Star 
Star Trek, you know, and Captain Jane making it. It's like, okay, we have we can do this. And it's still, even having that small network and kind of family that I was watching was something that day, day in and day out I was told wasn't okay and wasn't acceptable to the point that I was a sophomore in college um, as a history major when I had a professor study down every year round and science course were amazing. Why aren't you doing engineering? And I looked at it and girls do that. Um, and it was at that point that I learned that we, that we could, and that's part of the reason that I go around and I talk to young girls so much about being the figures that they may not be seeing, or you know, even if not represented in the media, or it's not represented in their hometown or in their own family, that they can be that person for someone else. Um, Carrie Byron from the original Infusters was that for me, that embodiment of someone that was no longer a character, but was an actual woman and was an actual builder. And not only was she there, and she was never the token girl, she had full respect of all of her peers. And it was that relationship, not just as her as a figure on television being a female builder, but someone that had respect and it was never a question of why. Because she had the skills that she deserved to be there 100%. Like, that kind of gave me that strength to pursue my career. Um, how many of you out there love the bunch? Well, the friends of love. Christine? Yes. <laughs> the bunch delves deep into what PTSD and other mental health disorders can look like, and it appears to be very accurate. Can you talk about what kind of research went into that show in your writing? Sure, yeah, happy to. Um, <laughs> the writing staff was we not afraid to go very deep. So um, uh, Steve Lightfoot is a terrific showrunner. He uh, has his own um, history and, and brought that to bear uh, on the show. And we each of us brought our own sort of. Uh, so you know, some people who were veterans were sisters of veterans were children of veterans. All of that came into play. Uh, we spoke with a lot of experts in the field. We spoke with social workers. We spoke with VA um, administrators and all but the people who are really in contact on the ground with um, veterans who come back and try to get settled. Uh, we spoke with some classified dudes who could not give us their names, talk about special forces and what that, um, the, toll, the emotional toll it takes on you, and also uh, emotionally how it's helpful how they can work through their emotions by doing these missions, which I didn't expect to hear. I was surprised by. Um, but we also just sort of the the day to day trauma uh, that everybody, every human being has. We brought that to bear on the show. So um, you know, every single scene involves somebody's pain, even if it's picking up a cup of coffee, even if it's humorous. And to me, the most important thing on a show like that is having humor. You have to have those funny moments between characters. And it reveals so much character about what someone's doing. Why is it funny? Who's laughing? Is the audience laughing? Are the characters in the scene laughing? So the darker the show gets, the more you need humor. And a lot of times that humor reveals the character's trauma. So that was another tool in our toolbox. Can I, can I just throw one thing in about Punisher? I, I, I wrote some Punisher comics over the years. And, um, <laughs> um, when I was doing the Punisher, just then, it was right around the time Disney bought Marvel, and I, you know, I was doing some things showing, exploring the psychological dynamic of what it looked like to be that character, and we, we got serious pushback. We had we couldn't make the Punisher, we couldn't change the Punisher's uh, psychological uh, man the manifestation of the psychological damage, or show either healing or him getting worse. And yet uh, now we roll forward. That was ten years ago. Roll forward. Exactly what they told me we couldn't do in the show. And that show was brilliant. I mean, it really, it, it, it took it from being a one-note character into a fully three-dimensional character that was yeah. totally believable. I absolutely love that, uh, what you guys did with that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it really meant a lot to us to make it as grounded and, and real as possible. The word realism and realistic, I don't really care for, but real or truthful. If it's emotionally truthful, then it's real, right? So. That's what we cared about. If we could get the emotions right and then communicate that to the actors who were so brilliant and they were able to portray it. Everyone who worked on the show cared about what they were doing and knew they had a responsibility towards people who had been through experience.
experiences like that. Maybe not that heightened, <laughs> you know, but also showing, yeah, there's violence, and the violence feels like a great release when you're killing a bunch of bad guys, but um, mm -hmm. there's a toll taken on the perpetrator, there's a toll taken on the community, and, and what does that mean? So. Well, Christy, you mentioned that writing involves pain, and Derek, yeah. you, 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 you write for both the Flash and the Arrow, and well, I have the full disclosure. We tried to interview you billionaire archers, but there weren't many. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? And Why have we none of these guys just said, let's do something right? And CSI speedsters didn't exist, so <laughs> we, we had to make it up ourselves. I mean, we really wanted to be authentic to it, but it just was awesome. <laughs> well, well, the, the good thing is you guys tap into this authentic like traumatic experience with both of the guys. I mean, they, they both have extremely traumatic experiences, they both have extremely traumatic losses, and what is it like to bring relatable struggles to the world characters, and how do writers look for inspiration and accurately portray them in a the, the fictional world? I think you bring your own personal experiences to the writing. But look, I mean, none of us have ever been beaten up by Russian monsters more so than no. like, emotional. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one person just wrote and raised their hand up here. So I play Call of Duty. But I think that, yeah, you know, you start from your own personal experiences and you put it in there and then you just have to put on that hat of like, okay, what are we trying to convey and tell here and try to be, uh, you know, uh, try to tell the most compelling story possible. And then, But also, the thing is, you knowing that the campus that you're, you know, that you're, that you're, you're painting on, right, is this, there is a sort of a sense of like, responsibility, especially because, like, this panel, as you're saying, people are affected by what they watch and, you know, and, and why they watch. And so there is a very conscious effort to make sure that when the stories that you're telling, that, you know, you know there, there's a sense of responsibility behind it. I think that's becoming more and more common because now writers are much more aware of that. I think they were always aware of it, but I think now they're much more understanding about it. Because there was sort of a, oh yeah, you know, I write that one issue, you know, you can watch it, or, or you know, why don't you just change the channel if you don't like it, you know? But for people that do and want to see something in there, they're searching for something in there, there's there's a sense of like, okay, when you write this, like, what, what is the story that we're really trying to tell here, what are you doing to a character? I love what you said there, how you um, draw upon your own personal experiences, because um, that leads into the next question I had perfectly <laughs> with uh, Dr. Scarlett. Um, superhero therapy combines pop culture and evidence-based therapy practices. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how you work on the sides? Um, sure. I think that the connections that they make, whether it's with real life people or fictionalized characters, can be quite changing sometimes. And the, the stronger that connection is, the more we might feel supported and understood. There are countless stories that uh, I've heard that people have shared with me on a regular basis where, because of their connection with either a, a fictional character or maybe somebody who was kind to them in real life, that person didn't end up taking their life when they intended to. Sometimes all we need is a, a kind word from a stranger or maybe uh, some kind of understanding from a friend. And so the, the work that I do involves a kind of, uh, creating those kind of connections for my clients in real life. A lot of people, when they come in to see me, tell me that I'm the first and only person in their life that they've ever shared their darkest, most, most deepest trauma, trauma experience with. Most people around us carry something really painful, and we might not know that story. We might assume that because they're smiling, that everything's okay. Because I think as a society, we're taught to wear the I am fine mask. We're not taught to connect, we're not taught to share those stories. And this is kind of like what Jonathan was saying earlier this is where fiction tells more of the truth than we sometimes share with one another in real life. So, in my work with my clients, we create these kind of surrogate connections with fictionalized characters, for example, Buffy, or our characters on um, Supernatural or Star Trek, um, in creating an understanding and a parallel of what those characters have been through, and then creating an understanding of how that character had found recovery and hope, and then creating a role model for my particular clients. So for example, we might do an exercise 
size where an individual might be one-on-one -on -one with, let's say, uh, Picard, for example, of Star Trek, or with the Winchesters uh, from Supernatural, and you see some kind of word of support or encouragement from their favorite role models in a time when they might be really, really struggling, so that that individual will leave us alone and um, form a better understanding that their traumatic experiences are not only a sign of weakness, but actually a sign of their greatest strength. Someone from my culture is making us look bad, or there's a dude who blames me for stuff before I was born that my dad did. Like, we, we can relate to that on some level. Uh, and most of these characters, you just break them down to, they're, they're a great display for emotional, um, not just realism, but for emotional outputs for us, because the, in the end, they just care. Like, Ollie Queen just wants his city to be better, and Barry just wants to help people. and. Like, you can bring up what brought them to this, but at the end, they also made the choice to care. Batman and Joker both, depending on which origin story you look at, lost a family. Joker decided, well, screw everyone. Batman said, no one else should have that. And, and I think the fact that some of these characters can be broken down in those simple terms, it's simple, but it's truthful. And it's simple, but it's also not easy. And they're explaining that, you know, caring is not easy. Yeah, and can I just, I want to tag on too, because sure. uh, I had this discussion recently with, with uh, a couple of friends who were writing comics, and there, there's a lot of discussion about nature versus nurture, but one of the things that a, that a lot of these shows, the better ones do, is, ex is explore the fact that, that nature versus nurture is an incomplete equation. It's nature, nurture, choice. Yeah. yeah. And the Batman Joker thing is a great example of choice. They both had similar forces at work in their, in their lives. My father you know, blamed a lot of the sort of things he did because of how he was raised. Yeah. Yet he raised me, and I'm not the same guy. So nature versus nature nurture and choice um, is what a lot of uh, good storytelling does. It explores that other element that you are not just a victim of circumstance. You're not a victim of genetics. It's your life. You have agency over it. And um, that becomes empowering for people who don't realize that they have agency over their lives or their own healing for the, the trauma they've been through. Well, John, you just mentioned uh, good storytelling. And one of your stories of yours is about to be a new show on Netflix. Um, and what I want to know is what can you share about this project? And can you, can you talk about the process of creating these like, psychologically diverse characters? What happens in the season now? Everyone does. Fantastic. So uh, the, the premise of Beavers is just is pretty simple. Melting polar ice releases a, a, an ancient disease that triggers a dormant gene, and that gene codes for vampirism. Science. Science. It turns out vampirism is genetic. It's not a disorder, rather. Than a uh, it turns out vampirism is a genetic disorder, not supernatural. So this, the whole subtext of the story is people begin emerging. Uh, are presenting as vampires, but it means that they, they're simply being who they now are, and the people who are not vampires push back against it. So it's racism, it's culture clash, it's gender clash, it's a lot of a lot of these different issues are the subtext of the story, um, and we use vampirism as, as a way of being able to, as the vehicle to tell that kind of story. And um, the, the fun thing about the, uh, the show is, is the writers the writers have got that. You know, they, they didn't go with, with all the high concept stuff. It really does boil down to the struggle between um, what someone else wants you to be or requires you to be in order for them to accept you and who you actually are. And, you know, can you demand to be accepted for who you are? And also the fact that, that you know, just because you're human or vampire doesn't mean you're good or bad. You know. um, they're doing a great job on the show. We actually have an Arrow actor on the show, uh, uh, Adrian Holmes. Who was one of the cops in Arrow uh, is, is actually our co-star of the show. Uh, great, doing a great job, and he plays somebody whose new nature is that he's now a super predator. But um, 
he feels, you know, the character feels that that releases him from the standard conventions because he's no longer human. So is he then bound by human rules? And the, the writers explored that, but the actor also took that, you know, a couple steps further and put himself in the place of the character. Like, if he's not human, what does that mean to him? You know, what is his new identity? What are the, what are the, the morals and, and so on about that? And it's, it, it's a fun series to, to have written and to work with, and I love the way they're handling it for the show. They're allowing the, the, each character to be unique rather than, oh, that's vampire, that's bad. You know, or that's human, that's good. And uh, every character carries with them a bit of damage, some of which is before the story starts, and some of it is a result of the actions in the story. There's not one character who's not emotionally completely screwed up by the end of the, of the first season. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. So what I'm hearing is that Lee Moore's character crossover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's not the weirdest era of thing that's happened. We're talking about a V Wars 30 Days of Night crossover comic. Oh. And a V Wars X Files crossover comic. Because I've done a lot of X Files stuff too, so yes. that, that might happen. <laughs> yeah. I can barely speak to you guys. V Wars stuff. If you do a V Wars, we wish. I mean. <laughs> Damn. I would so want to write that. <laughs> um. I want to ask this next uh, question to Tanner. Um, you work for Midbusters at Midbusters Jr. Um, can you talk about your work with them and the importance of gender diversity in science, technology, engineering, and in mathematics, especially in modeling, modeling STEM to kids of all genders and backgrounds? Yeah, so it's, um, it's really interesting. When I kind of went into this initially, I thought I'm going to get out there and I'm going to inspire little girls to go into STEM. And it's actually been the outpouring from parents that have been telling me about how much it's affecting their sons, that it's had the greatest impact on me, and it made me realize that by being there and, and doing things that young men and young women assume are only male gender roles or female gender roles, it's helping them to kind of widen their perspective of what it is. So this season, um, I had the joy of getting to actually work on the Buster's Junior without a savage and six kids from across the nation. They were all under 16. And I mean, our youngest was 12. Cannon, he's a sophomore in college studying astrophysics. Um, and one of the things that was most exciting to me was that our cast was so inclusive and diverse. You know, when I, when I competed on Professor's Research, I showed up thinking, what if I'm the only girl? What if I'm the only one that shows up? And then we actually ended up having three girls. Um, in the competition, so we were 30%, which is about right for science and engineering, um, engineering especially in the U.S., but we were all white women, and it was something that broke my heart, because I knew so many incredible, diverse engineers, and I was like, well, how is this all that we were able to find for this? Um, and so when we started shooting our babies to get diversity and inclusion within our class, was really amazing, but research has shown that as early as elementary school, little girls are starting to doubt their abilities to be in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics courses. They're starting to think within their own minds and be told by their peers that that's not where they're supposed to be as girls. And we saw that on the set. You know, I made the goal when I went into junior that all three young women were going to leave knowing how to weld. And telling their parents that is one that was like, like, no, 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 my daughter is only, well, she's not going to handle it. Like, oh, she's going to learn how to weld, so make sure she's not in stretchy jeans. Um, and so all of them laughed as, as welders. You know, some, some of the boys also like, have the skill, and there's a been and learned along with us as well. But it was something that really, truly empowered them. And getting to see the looks on their faces when they had welded steel on steel and actually made something out of it was really rewarding to me. And, and I do remember one of the mothers actually told me on the young man, she said, you know, she's like, they're from Louisiana, so they're from the Southeast where, where I grew up as well. And it, she said to me, she said, it is so important that my son is here welding next to you every day. And he's seeing you do this because his dad loves his amazing hot rods, but he's in the shop with only them. And there are no women doing this for he's growing up. So getting to see that, and mom is a very strong woman. She's an incredible designer and artist. 
like she said, until he saw me welding with him. And he realized that I was going to be there all day doing that. He was like, no, girls don't do that. You know, and it was something that became, you know, something he's taken from the set. And his dad actually, after the show started airing, like, did a thank you um, for that experience for his son. And I think it was something that we saw him grow, and then we all got to grow as a, as a team that summer. And I think seeing that has opened even my eyes to the realization that it's not just a part of the young women, but it's also a part of the young guys. But absolutely. Um, absolutely. You know, TV, t- t- like, the dangerous thing and the wonderful thing is that it normalizes stuff for us. And, and there are just so many things where once anyone sees someone from that perspective, they're just like, oh, I, I haven't considered it. Yeah, there could be a woman doing that. There could be a black person doing that. There could be a Latin American who doesn't conform to what certain things told me they do. And things like that. And so, I mean, it also just gives you a safe space to talk about things like, here's a Star Trek episode dealing with a genderless planet. What does that mean to you? Well, I, I notice that TV does that better than film. Yes. Uh, like in in, in uh, Flash, for example, you know, it's a multi multi uh, ethnic cast. At no point do they pause to, to talk about how unusual it is that there's a biracial uh, marriage or anything. It's just how people are in the show, and it, it normalizes things in a way that that takes the uh, it steps away from there having to be an argument and and, and having to be tokenism. Um, well, you have, you have a wider canvas to explore everyone, yeah. so it doesn't feel like anyone's shoved in by episode six or seven. Hopefully, if you're doing your job. I mean, we were just talking about empowering women, and one thing that we don't talk about as a society is, you know, emotions for men. And um, this question is actually for you, Billy. Um, you're an avid family of wrestling, which is for awesome. some. An example of cult television. I mean, how many of you like wrestling? <laughs> <laughs> so, it, 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 it's cult cool. TV. And can you talk about some examples of emotion expression that athletes as well as entertainers in the field might carry and how it might impact? All right, so I got a pitch for you guys. <laughs> Imagine the framing of a comic book. Imagine superheroes, okay? And they're wearing the exact same costumes. Maybe the decks are a little tighter. And we put them in the ring and you get a full on action scene. And you get to watch every punch, every kick. You get to live and breathe as they ride to defeat victory. Wouldn't you want to watch that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That's basically professional wrestling. Now, don't get wrong, there's a lot of that's garbage. There's a lot of Everyone started nodding. Like, yeah. <laughs> But when professional wrestling is good, and they get you invested in a character, you start sharing those emotions with that character. Now back in the day, uh, <coughs> kayfabe, anyone here not know what kayfabe is? Or before breaking kayfabe. So kayfabe is the idea that the, the wrestlers are supposed to pretend that the wrestling is quote unquote real. The, the, the anger is real, the hatred is real. Back in those days, we had very clear-cut ideas of the good guy and the bad guy. Hulk Hogan, good. <coughs> now it's good, but Hulk Hogan, good. <laughs> Iron Sheep, bad. Along, back then, it was kind of a, uh, a more simplistic idea of emotion. Cheer for the good guy. Don't cheer for the bad guy. If the bad guy is winning, you feel bad. Nowadays, uh, wrestling has evolved to where they're starting to break that cake. The lines of reality and fantasy that we cross, which is very similar to how we experience life. A lot of times we're not sure who the good guy or the bad guy is. A lot of times we're not sure how to feel. Am I supposed to be angry? Am I supposed to be happy? Am I supposed to be sad? Is it possible to feel all those feelings at once? So when you watch professional wrestling, a lot of times you'll start feeling that. Or at least I do. Maybe I'm just weird. I'm weird in a lot of other ways, but maybe that's one of the ways I'm weird. <coughs> so, oh, this bad guy is really getting beat up by the good guys. I should feel happy, but I feel kind of bad for them. And it's that emotional connection to that character. 
And what's great is I've had some panels with some professional wrestlers, and when you go past the idea of pay, and you talk to them about their real lives, and what it takes to be in that business, it's humanity to the fullest extent that humanity can be. They're on the road 300 plus days a year. They're sacrificing their bodies, their minds, their relationships, to do what they love to do and entertain the audiences. And it's become a cult TV phenomenon in its own culture because the audience is in on it. We know we know it's not real. There's like one person in the back going, it's not real! It's not real. I don't write it around. He fell off a 10-foot ladder and showed up next to me with no bruises. That happens. <laughs> it happens. Um, we're in on it, but we suspend our disbelief just enough to where we can ride those emotions. And that's the beauty of it. There are storylines and character arcs that really resemble real life uh, experiences. For example, this WrestleMania, I believe, is the first time that women are going to be headlining WrestleMania. Woo! To now, arenas, sold out arenas, men, women, and children are giving them standing ovations based on their talent and their skill and respect them as performers. So, um, the, the parallels to real life are fascinating. And that is a very long, tangential answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Woo! I actually, you know. I, I really love what you were talking about, the emotional connections you, you get with somebody, like a character or anything. And how many of you out here like Doctor Who? I mean, Woo! Uh, yes. um, Alan Kister literally wrote the book on Doctor Who history. Okay, so my next question is for you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please talk about the the new Doctor? Mm -hmm. Who is finally, after all these years, regenerated into a woman? What? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> is that a general question? No, I'll, I'll, I'll give you more. All right, sure. <laughs> I mean, she's awesome. <laughs> but what might affect, like, a lot, there was a lot of pushback at first, you know, and what might affect who means uh, and general fans? Uh, Sure. And what are some ways you can help promote gender diversity in the future? I mean, to answer the last part first, uh, you promote it by freaking having it. <laughs> just do it. Just make the decision to do it. Like, how are we going to have more women that should just do it? It's a show. Do it. Uh, it's like you, if you have these fictional worlds where the audience will accept telepathic gorillas. <laughs> and it's like spirits coming out of the woodwork and everything. It is not more insane to say, and in this episode, two women defeat. Yeah, sure, why the hell not? Uh, the, like there's a slightly on the tangent, Star, Star Wars. Uh, I remember there was this, the discussion after The Force Awakens about uh, possible shipping possibilities regarding two of the male characters. And I remember on. One discussion I sort of ran into a guy was arguing like, well, I don't really think that's realistic because we saw him like he had a crush on a girl, so he, he's not gay. And I was like, all right, well, the possibility that he's bi or open to anything or not conforming to 21st century Earth labels <laughs> is not less realistic than the Force. <laughs> You freaking promote gender, just do it. You know, you it. Uh, Sydney Newman, the creator of Doctor Who, the creator, wanted the Doctor to become a woman in 1987. The BBC wrote to him, things were not going great. Also, the BBC director didn't like the Sixth Doctor personally, and there was a whole issue there. You should Google it, it's wonderful. Um, and 
and, and they wrote Sidney Newman, like, how, how should we revive the show? And Sidney Newman wrote a memo, and a couple of the suggestions involved uh, new companions, the doctor's with them for a few episodes, and then regenerates, becomes a woman, and does not understand at first why they are treating her differently. And it's 1987, that's the creator. Like, so Jodie Whittaker is brilliant, at the same time, my excitement was mixed with, this is 20 years overdue. And uh, the fact that anyone was questioning whether this would ruin a show, wherein the conceit is that the hero is a transforming alien, <laughs> who half of his plans fail. Like, of course it's not. He, he's able to fight any monster you imagine, the show can go anywhere, why can't the story go anywhere? Uh, and also, it's, it's delightful with a time travel show, uh, to me, that would be a uh, woman hero for a while, because automatically that if you go to the past, <laughs> not even, you know, the far away distant past, just 15 years ago, uh, a larger part of this population incrementally will trust the doctor's authority less, simply because, uh, well, it's a woman, how could she possibly know what she's talking about? And that's a great frustration, that's great drama, because you want to make things difficult for the hero to get their point across and to get people to listen to them, but it's also great to really show kids, and Doctor Who is an all-ages family show, half the audience is kids, really show them, yeah, that is unfair, isn't it? That really sucks that they made that assumption, doesn't it? Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's wonderful, I think it's uh, no accident that with the Doctor Who spin-offs, most of them have been women-led. If you listen to the audio plays, <laughs> Uh, they've been fantastic. Sarah Jane stuff, uh, Charlie Pollard from the Eighth Doctor, uh, Unit. There's a Unit audio play series that's been going on, and like and again, you've got Kate uh, running that show. Like it's it's great stuff because why not?
And I think that in addition to teaching our children math and science in school, we need to be talking about emotional intelligence. We need to be talking about understanding mental health and identifying other people's emotions, understanding what somebody might be going through and what they might need. And what I would love to see is more um, English classes and science classes and, and even math classes and, and health classes talking about these subjects where, um, in addition to reading about the modern pathology that you're referring to, we're also able to bring in conversations about mental health and conversations about um, talking about our emotions and by connecting to some of the characters. Things like that are starting, and unfortunately that, that spread is um, not as quick as we would like to see. There are a number of programs that I'm now consulting with, a number of different schools, hospitals, um, prisons, um, and uh, military bases that are now using superhero therapy as the basis for um, teaching, um, whether it's children or adults, about mental health through that exact pathology. And I would just love to see it being a part of the basic common core curriculum where every child in every school in the country is able to learn mental health skills from first grade. Just have, try, if you have an ensemble show, just try and make it a real ensemble so it doesn't look like everything. 
Sure, show up there. I mean, it's my sort of blubbering quick answer. Uh, okay. And also let, let every character be multiple things. Yes. Because like don't don't let that be the woman character. Don't right. let that be the Latin character. Right. There there was no Wonder Woman movie for a while because studios thought, well, we can't decide if she's supposed to be a warrior or she's supposed to be a princess, she's supposed to be an ambassador. Like Mother Trucker, she is everything. What are you talking about? <laughs> Bruce Wayne is like five different things. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you. Okay. Thank you all for coming out. And if you're